Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you to Michael from Patreon for suggesting today's case. I also wanted to go ahead and give a huge shout out to my other patrons, Joanne and Scarty Ginge. I hope I'm saying that right. Thank you guys so much for supporting my channel. You are the reason that I'm able to keep up with the best possible content that I can give you guys. And for that, I appreciate you guys so much more than I could ever put into words. With that, let's get into today's case. Today's case is very frustrating. It really reminds me a lot of the case that we covered last week about Tess Ritchie, and it also reminds me a lot of Holly Ellsworth Clark. There are a lot of aspects to this case that were just reported so wrongly, so a lot of this video is going to be going ahead and either debunking or kind of discussing those aspects of the case as we go along. So with that being said, let's just get right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the case of Kaylin Lauder. Kaylin Lauder was born on January 24th, 1984 with her twin brother Colton to her parents Jesse and Susan Lauder in American Fork, Utah. Kaylin was described as being outgoing, compassionate, loving, and could basically make friends with anybody. She was also described as being incredibly competitive and was absolutely passionate about helping others. She was non-judgmental and just accepted others for who they were. She loved animals, especially her pug, Phyllis. She also enjoyed reading books and riding horses. She went to high school at Lehigh High School in Utah and then went on to attend Utah State University and graduated with a bachelor's degree in social work in 2006. Now, before we get into Kaylin's actual case, there was another big event in her family that's not necessarily directly related to her case, but it had quite a big impact on the whole family. So on February 27th, 2009, a 25-year-old Colton, Kaylin's twin brother, was at his uncle Jeffrey Adkins house. Sometime in the afternoon, Jeffrey was loading his equipment into the car, getting ready for a camping trip that he had planned for that weekend. At around 12.45 p.m., neighbors reported that they heard two men fighting very loudly outside. When one of the neighbors looked outside of his window, they witnessed Jeffrey chasing another man off of his driveway and into a field. The man that was being chased then turned around as he was running and shot Jeffrey three times in the chest and stomach. Of course, these neighbors neighbors who just saw this were absolutely shocked and terrified, so they immediately called police. Very quickly, police arrived and tended to the victim, Jeffrey, and took him to the hospital while also working to identify the shooter. Unfortunately, by the time Jeffrey reached the hospital, though, he was declared dead. Then, at around 2 p.m. that same day, a worker at a nearby urgent care spotted a man with a gun standing by the corner, so this worker immediately called police. Police quickly arrived, and what they saw was a man who was just standing there with his hands up, saying that he didn't do it, but he was cooperative with police when he was arrested. Upon searching the area, police found a 45 pistol on the hood of a car that was parked near the building. During all of this, of course, police shut down all of the schools and pretty much the entire area to make sure no one was out walking around, kids weren't coming home, parents weren't, you know, outside with their kids while this gunman was on the loose. Mind you, this is a very small town in Utah. This type of thing did not happen very often at all. This was pretty terrifying when residents of this neighborhood saw two grown men chasing and shooting each other. When police apprehended the suspect, it did turn out to be Colton Louder. Now, clearly, Colton was the one who shot his uncle. However, it was not exactly clear at first why this all even happened. Now, it was known to pretty much everybody that Colton did use drugs. It was also thought at the time that he may have been breaking and entering into people's houses around the neighborhood and stealing things. So people thought initially that maybe he was at his uncle's house to try and steal things, and that's why they got into an argument where Jeffrey started chasing him off of his property or they thought that maybe Jeffrey was trying to help Colton get off of drugs and that maybe they had some sort of argument that caused Colton to run off and then shoot Jeffrey as he was chasing him. However, after running tests on both Colton and Jeffrey, turns out both of them had been doing a very large amount of meth at the time of the shooting. Family members and those who knew both Colton and Jeffrey said that whenever Colton would do drugs, he would become very, very paranoid, while Jeffrey would become very 
angry when he did drugs. So because of this, it seems obvious that the reason this entire thing happened was because they got into an argument and then, you know, Jeffrey, because he was on drugs, got very, very angry um, and started chasing Colton. And then Colton, who's also on drugs, who's very, very paranoid, got really afraid of this angry man who was chasing him. Obviously, it is not an excuse for either of them, but that does seem to be what ended up happening. So because of this, Colton pled guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced for five years in prison. Then Colton was in and out of prison for quite a few years and he really was getting in a lot of trouble pretty often after this happened. But during this time, the Louder family seemed to be taking this entire tragedy better than most families would. They understood what happened and of course they were all very upset but they stuck together as a family and just got through it all together. Also, at this time, Kaylin was working for Rover.com, which is a dog walking and dog sitting and boarding and babysitting type of thing, which is a website I frequently use for boarding my dog. She was also employed at some sort of boys' school. I wasn't exactly sure what kind. However, sometime in 2014, she actually lost her job at the school. I'm also not quite sure exactly how she lost her job, but she was unemployed for a little bit over a year at the time. Now, she never really had any history of any serious mental health issues or anything like that, but of course, she was a little bit down about not being able to find a job. So her dad did say that she was a little bit depressed, but overall, she was in pretty good spirits. She was still applying for all these jobs, updating her resume. Her mother says that, you know, she would go in and check on Kaylin pretty much every single day and stated that she, again, was a little bit out of character around this time. But again, it wasn't totally out of the norm for someone who was looking for work and was struggling to find a job. However, around this time, Kaylin did start to act a little bit strange and made several 911 calls over the course of a few days. Now, on Friday, September 26th, 2014, a little past 9 p.m., Kaylin makes her first 911 call. During the call, she tells the operator that there was a fight going on at her condo's clubhouse. Now, there was a wedding reception at the time, so there was a bit of commotion going on, but Caitlin reported that she had either heard gunshots or that she believed that there was a gun at the clubhouse. So police responded to the clubhouse. When they got there, the reception was still going on, but they said that there were absolutely no signs of fighting or guns at the clubhouse. When they asked the guests there, they also confirmed that there were no fights that broke out at the clubhouse that night. Then, an hour later, that same night at around 10 p.m., she called 911 again, but she actually hung up before anyone answered. The dispatcher did call Caitlin back, but they said that when they did, Caitlin answered and she was just sort of mumbling around. She was very hard to hear, and she sounded like she was very confused on the the phone and said that she could not remember her own address. She told the dispatcher that her roommate called her delusional and mentioned that she lives in a don't tell, don't meddle community and she didn't want to put her friends in any danger. So these first two 911 calls are just based on reports that have been made. I don't have any actual recording of them and I haven't actually heard them. I don't think they've been released to the public. However, she did make a third 911 call the next day on September 27th at around 8.18 a.m. and we do have a recording of that one. In the call, she says that there's an intruder or intruders in her house and she can be heard talking to them, telling them to get out and to shut up. She says that she doesn't actually see any of the intruders but said that she can hear them in the other room and we're assuming that she's in the bedroom while all this is happening. She does sound very distressed throughout the phone call but you can also hear her talking to her roommate throughout the call. She also is very coherent and is answering all of the dis your question throughout the entire thing. Her roommate is kind of, you know, going against her roommate is kind of disagreeing with her, saying that there's no way that anyone could have gotten in because the deadbolt they had on the door was still locked. Caitlin also says that the night previous, she saw someone standing outside of her window outside looking at her, but again, her roommate does not think that that happened. Caitlin insists that she heard people talking and knows for a fact that she heard someone come in. 911, what's the address of your emergency? 85 I have of the house. Repeat the address for verification. They're stealing shit from my house. Okay, say your address one more time. I'm having a hard time hearing you. <laughs> Murray. And the phone number you're calling from? 801. Get the out of my house. And repeat the phone number for verification. Eight. Okay, do you know who this person is? 
No, I don't. I just know that there's an intruder in my house. You don't know who they are? No, I don't. Please hurry. Are you at the location now? Yes, I am. Were weapons involved or mentioned? They're not talking or responding. I'm just telling them to leave so I can hear them taking things. So you haven't seen them? You can just hear them? Yes, correct. Are you or anyone else in immediate danger? I believe so. <laughs> okay, are you able to get yourself to safety? Um, I just want to answer that while he's here. I'm sorry, what? No. Can you talk freely with me? Yeah. Okay, where exactly are you? I'm in the back bedroom. Okay. <sighs> Where did the suspect door. enter the building? Um, there's only one door it's on the west side. Okay, where are the possible exits from the building? There's only one. Get out of my is there, house! Is there anyone else in the building who belongs there? Yes, there's six apartments. I'm sorry, what? Six. There's six people? Six apartments. Okay, is there anybody else in your apartment that should be there? I believe she is here. I have a roommate. Where is she at? Next door to me. Okay, I'm just going to stay on the line with you until officers get there, okay? Just let me know if anything changes. What is your last name? Louder. And your first name? Kaylen. It's what? Kaylen. Can you still hear them? Yes. Where does it sound like they're at? The front room. It's a small place. Shut up. Are they saying anything? No. Yeah, I heard someone say, hey, go in there. So there's obviously two of them. Hey, Karen, lock the door. There's, there's something going on there. Come here. Come here. They might have left. Okay, what's going on now? Hello? Okay. Didn't they left? They've left now? Yeah, so I'm just gonna look and see if anything's been taken. Someone opened the door and I heard them come in, so okay. I know that they know where they went at all? No, don't don't do that, Carol. The door's still locked. It's not impossible. They, I, they must have a key or something. Because when I I took the dog out, I heard people talking. Um, and there was people last night, like sitting outside the window. And so they like were scoping us out or something. Nobody knows about the key. Oh, About like the the fake key. Or the yeah, but nobody knows about it. It's impossible. Well, I, I took it out. Like, I had it on my person. I swear to God, someone opened the door. And there's actually, like, people like No No, Rachel. Like, people see me get out there all the time. Yeah, it's your thing. In state. In state. In the And then, yes, why is the door still locked? Well, I can't explain that, but I heard, like, two people talking. Are, is the officer close? What was that? Is the officer close? I'm not sure where they're coming from. They're on the way. I don't know where they're coming from, though. Huh. I, what do you want them? What do you want from them? You don't know what I'm do what in the bathroom? We have a clock in the bathroom, so it's six. Yeah, I don't know. Six. <laughs> but if something sticks in that room, you have to. Um, so, so, so. so the I have to.
So again, based on this 911 call, it seems like Kaylin was in her room with the door shut. Then whatever intruder she heard walked in through the front door into the living room. Then as she's talking to 911, it seems like her roommate comes out of her respective room and into Kaylin's room or maybe she's talking to Kaylin loudly from her own room through the wall. But to me, even though the roommate is a little bit hard to hear, it does seem like she's close enough to the phone that I do think that she's in her room and not speaking through the walls. Either way, a few minutes into the phone call, it seems like they start walking around and opening the door and left the bedrooms after they think that the intruders had left. It also seems like the roommate who I think's name is Carol, um, it seems like she doesn't believe Kaylin that anyone had broken in. So one possible idea that I've heard in regards to this call is that maybe Kaylin had heard Carol sort of rustling around in her own room, or maybe she heard her turn on her TV or listening to music or something like that and thought that it was an intruder. If you're in your own room in an apartment or condo, it can be really easy to mistake noises that others are making in their rooms as people who are intruding your apartment. Now, I have personally personally had experience with living alone in an apartment in a second floor with one floor above me. People would walk past my door all the time with others having conversations. They would knock on my neighbor's doors or someone upstairs would drop something and I would hear a very loud thump or someone who is maybe rustling around at their own door makes it sound like someone's rustling around with my door. Sometimes people walking up the stairs or walking past when I'm in my bedroom with the door closed can really make it sound like someone is walking in through my door into my apartment living room. There's also been times where stuff was going on outside my door and I couldn't tell if someone was messing around with my door maybe trying to get in or if it was someone maybe carrying groceries into their own apartment or just talking with someone in their own apartment, it's really hard to tell and in my experience, I can definitely see how someone can start thinking that someone's breaking into your apartment without actually looking. I've had one night when I almost called police because I was in my own bedroom and I swore that I heard someone open my door and walk in. At the time, I had my own bedroom door shut so I was absolutely terrified to open it because I was so scared that I would open it and see someone just standing in the dark in my living room. Luckily, I do have some self-defense tools that I was able to grab and make myself feel safer after looking in my own apartment. Obviously, no one was actually out there and I was completely safe, but I can definitely see how someone could mistake random noises for someone breaking into your apartment, even if no one was. But then on the other hand, something that I did think was really weird was that she was talking very loudly on the phone with police. She wasn't whispering, trying to hide the fact that she was on the phone with police. She was actually yelling out to them and telling them to shut up. That's pretty bold if you ask me. I feel like if you really are terrified and you think that someone's breaking in, I feel like you wouldn't want to yell out to them or you wouldn't want them to know that you know they're there, but that's just me. Maybe she handles things differently and we can't really judge that. The other thing I do want to mention is that at least to me, she did sound very coherent on this phone call. I do think that she sounded a little bit disoriented and distressed, but she was speaking very clearly. She was answering all of the questions to the dispatcher and talking very matter-of-factly, giving him directions, telling them where they are in respect to the rest of the apartment. She's pretty much speaking to a 911 dispatcher exactly how you'd expect. To me, it seemed like she was talking very normally and, you know, some people might say that she seemed a little bit paranoid, but if you are afraid that someone actually broke in, of course you're gonna sound a little bit, you know, out of your element. You're gonna sound a little bit scared. I think that's completely normal. So I personally don't really know what to think about this call. I know a lot of people have stated that it seems like she's crazy and paranoid and, you know, just out there and making things up. Um, but her family has stated that she didn't sound delusional at all and it's pretty much exactly how she always was. I think the main reason why people think that this phone call was, you know, fake or, you know, just her being paranoid is because after police arrived, they did examine her condo and there was no evidence of a break-in. So I just want to keep all of that in mind as we go throughout the rest of this video. Okay, so after this phone call that same day on September 27th, we see Kaylin on surveillance video at her condo parking lot at around 3.30 p.m. During this clip, she is seen outside walking in some light rain, wearing black shorts, a white tank top, and is barefoot. She walks behind something that looks like a big mesh fence or something by trees. 
I've also heard that it's a massive pile of rocks or something like that, but honestly, I can't tell what it is. Then at 5.45 p.m., she was seen on video again, but this time she was seen jogging barefoot outside back from where she came from behind that fence or pile of rocks. It was reported a lot that she was seen running away from something very fast, but she did not seem like she was running away from anything to me. She wasn't really running at a pace that seemed like she was in a panic or trying to get away from anyone or anything. She was being careful not to step on something. She was looking around her environment. Again, her speed did not indicate that she was in any sort of danger or a panic. Then in the next surveillance video, we see her again in that same parking lot walking around carrying her dog. She then sets her dog down and looks like she's starting to talk to her. Now again, in a lot of sources and articles, it says that it looks like she's having a very animated conversation with herself. In fact, a lot of the titles in articles will say, girl who went missing has animated conversation with herself right before she went missing. I have seen a lot of posts talking about this in Reddit threads. Obviously, I read through all these conversations and a lot of them said that she looked like she was talking to herself. I think police even said at one point that she was having this animated conversation with herself. But to me, it looks like she is very, very clearly talking to her pug. I don't think she's acting weird because I'm literally constantly talking or even singing to my dog and I'm just as animated as her, if not more, and I'm sure my neighbors think that I'm a crazy person because I'm constantly talking to her and having full-fledged conversations with my dog. Also, just as a side note, I think it's so frustrating how many people have just straight up said that she's having a conversation with herself when she's very clearly talking to her small dog. Obviously, you can't really see the dog in the entire surveillance video because she's a small pug, but she was just holding her dog and you can see her putting the dog down on the ground. Then in the next surveillance video, we see her going behind the silver van that we have seen in every video, but this time it just seems like she's just waiting there. It is possible that she was just waiting for her dog to go to the bathroom. Then in the last video, we see another girl walking by wearing black clothes and yellow boots coming from that same area behind the trees. Then in the last video, we see that same red car again driving past in the parking lot. Now for this case, I also watched John Warden's video on this, which I will have linked down below, but in his video, he mentioned that the girl walking across may be Kaylin's roommate and that the red car seemed to belong to the roommate. So from these videos to me, it seems like she took her dog out and then and jogged back to her condo. Maybe she forgot a poop bag or maybe she needed to grab something or something like that. I've done that many times before where I take my dog out and have to sprint back to get a poop bag so it doesn't look like I'm just, you know, leaving my dog's poop sitting there. But either way, it does look like she could be running back in to get something and then comes back out. And then again, when she comes back out, it seems like she's just standing there waiting, probably waiting for her dog to go potty. Then we see what looks like, again, her roommate walking towards the garages and then a car driving by that again could possibly be the roommate's car. Now, the surveillance videos that we are viewing from are located on the complex's garages. So if it looks like they're walking towards the camera, under the camera, out of view, it seems like they're walking towards the garages. And then behind the apartment complex, there's a little bit of a creek and there's a trail behind there. So it seems like a lot of people will come from that trail to come and get into their garage or their apartment complex or whatever. So again, it looks like her roommate may be walking towards the garage and then drove off in her red car. Now, what is a little bit confusing is that I've seen these times report that I just talked about before, the 3.30 and then I think 5 again, um, but we don't actually know the exact times from when these videos come from and we don't know if that's their actual chronological order that we're seeing them in. Now, there was one main article that I looked at that had all these videos placed in that order, but there's no way to say that these are the actual chronological order of the videos or if that's just how they happen to post them. Either way, these surveillance videos is the very last time that anyone's seen Kaylin alive. Now, on on that next Monday, Susan realized that she hadn't seen or heard from Kaylin in a few days. She pointed this out to Jesse because, like I said, Susan had checked in with Kaylin every single day, so not hearing from her in a couple of days was very alarming. So, of course, Jesse tried calling Kaylin too, but he also could not get a hold of her. Then, the next day on Tuesday, Kaylin's roommate actually called the parents to see if they had seen Kaylin anywhere, but 
neither of them had. At this point, they were very, very concerned, so Jesse went over to the condo to see what was going on, but Kaylin was not there. What he did find, though, was that she left her phone, purse, wallet, and her dog behind. However, according to her parents, she did take her keys with her, and I've seen in some sources that her car was gone, but I've seen in other sources that her car was still there, so I'm not 100% sure. So, by that Wednesday, she was reported missing to the police. Immediately, by that next day, family and police set out on their searches. They hired a private investigator to help out with the case as well. Now, I want to mention that as it happens in so many cases like this one where it's reported that she was very clearly going out of her mind and having some sort of mental break, the public wasn't really that interested in keeping the lookout for her. In the public's minds, Kaylin was just some girl whose brother had gone to jail after using meth and killing somebody. Every report says that she's sitting there having a complete conversation with herself. They say that she falsely called 911 to report a break-in when there clearly wasn't one. When in reality, all of those things have very reasonable explanations and we know that a lot of people who see these articles, read these headlines, will not actually go in and watch the videos or do any deeper research. So when you see a headline that says, girl who went missing made several false police calls and was talking to herself, you automatically think, she must be on drugs or she must be crazy. Like I stressed in my Holly Ellsworth Clark video, you don't have to have schizophrenia or be on meth to be paranoid or scared. Someone could have actually been messing with her. Maybe she went through something that she didn't tell anyone about that caused her to be a little bit more on edge. Maybe she's just a very generally anxious person like I am and like I know so many of you are. The reason that I cover so many cases like this on my channel is because of news outlets and media outlets that only care about sensationalizing people's cases. It's not entertaining enough if it's just some normal girl who went missing. It's so much more crazy and wild and interesting if it's some girl who's having a crazy breakdown and talking to herself and doing doing all these crazy things. Again, you've heard me talk about the same thing in so many other of my videos, but even if she was going through these different things, if she was on drugs, if she was going through schizophrenia, it doesn't make finding her any less important. But the fact that it was so exaggerated and sensationalized makes it that much worse. Once again, I just want you to keep all of these things in mind as we go through the rest of this case. Now, as you can imagine, the family was even more frustrated than I am about the type of attention that her case was getting so they went out of their way to discuss her case to the public and they wanted to make it known that she was a college graduate, she was a social worker, she helped people, it was her life's work to help others in need. They made sure to say that they knew her better than anyone else did and she did not sound delusional in her 911 calls. They wanted to remind everyone that what you see in those videos and what news outlets are reporting are two very different things things. It was truly amazing to me because they wanted to make sure that people cared about finding Kaylin. However, after searching for just over two months, Kaylin's body was unfortunately found in December of 2014. Her body was found by a city worker in the Jordan River when they were in the water to inspect a clog in the drainage pipes around five or six miles away from Kaylin's condo. Her body was under a bridge partially floating while most of her was submerged and it was clear that she had been in the water for quite some time. Her body had been covered in leaves and other debris and was pinned up against a concrete wall in the water so it's thought that that's why she hadn't been found earlier. Her body had been in that water for such a long time that initially when they found her, they weren't able to identify an age or even a gender of the body. But of course, the body wasn't off for an autopsy and it was positively identified as belonging to Caitlin Lauder. Then after waiting for four long, grueling months for the autopsy results, the family was incredibly disappointed to be faced with the results that left her cause of death as undetermined as result of water exposure. They found absolutely no signs of Trauma that could point in any sort of direction, and her body was in the water for so long that it definitely could have gotten rid of any evidence that could have been on there. The toxicology report also came back and showed that she had absolutely no illegal drugs or substances in her system. So that's pretty much all we know about this case. So now let's discuss the theories as to how she got into that water. So the first theories are that she could have fallen into the creek behind her apartment complex and her body floated all the way into the bigger part of the Jordan River. 
However, as you look at how far it is and how many obstacles there would be along the way, that just doesn't really seem plausible whatsoever. First, you see how far her body would have had to float five or six entire miles in this water. There are several obstacles along the way that block her ability to float all the way down, including some dams that are built and a bridge that would have been far too skinny and small for a whole body to pass through. Now, the water was deep enough for a body to have floated through it, but as John Lorden explains in his video, some people have said that it was super heavy rain and that it would have increased the water levels enough that she could have floated right past these obstacles. But as we see in the surveillance videos, the rain wasn't all that heavy. So it kind of doesn't really make sense that the water would have been risen enough for her to just go over all these obstacles very easily and not have been hit by a single one. Plus, if she floated all this way, how was there no trauma to her body? No cuts, scratches, or anything else that could indicate that she'd been swept through all of this water with these branches and logs and all of these different debris and who else knows what else could be in that water. That really doesn't make sense to me either. Now I understand that she was very decomposed at the point that they found her, but I feel like there would be some markings on her bones or just anywhere that indicated how far she had traveled through that water. Now I will say that it was very foggy the day that she was last seen and it had rained a little bit harder that morning until around 3 p.m. So right before we see the surveillance video, it had lightened up quite a bit. So it might not be completely false that it was a torrential downpour because it was raining a little bit harder before we see those videos where we see it just lightly raining. We also know that it rained for a few days prior to her disappearance, but this rain wasn't all that heavy. So again, there could have been some rising water levels, but to me, it doesn't seem like the water would have risen to a point that she would have just been above all of these different obstacles and just surpassed them. So in this theory, it's pretty much thought that she accidentally fell into the lake behind her apartment, that maybe she was taking her dog out and she slipped and fell somehow into the water. But the other thing with this theory that kind of goes against it is the fact that her dog was found in her apartment. It seemed like the main reason that Kaylin was even going back and forth between her apartment and outside was to take her dog out. So you'd think that if she fell into the creek that her dog would have been outside running loose, but he wasn't, he was inside. So it was obvious that she had gotten back inside to put her dog back inside. So then also along with the theory of her falling into the river is that some people will say that she walked all the way over to where she was found five or six miles and then fell into the river. However, this is a very, very far walk for her to make. Remember, in the surveillance videos right before she disappeared, she was wearing a white tank top, black shorts, and she was barefoot. First of all, to me, that's a very, very far walk to make in a tank top. It's cold, it's rainy, it's just very unpleasant. She'd be freezing the entire time and she wasn't even wearing shoes. Also though, if she walked in the rain the entire five or six miles, it seems like someone at least driving by would have seen her somewhere. This is a relatively populated area that she was walking in, so I feel like if she was walking barefoot in shorts and a tank top, she would have stood out and someone would have seen her and when they found out that she was missing and saw that, you know, this girl who was wearing the same exact outfit of her was now deceased or missing, I feel like someone would have called in and said that they saw her. But because no one reported that they saw her, it doesn't seem like anyone did. So to me, it doesn't seem like she would have made it all the way to this five to six miles to where she was found. So then also within these two theories, we have to discuss her toxicology report. There was absolutely no illegal drugs in her system, so we know she was not doing meth like her brother. We know that she was not on any other sort of narcotics that could cause her to just lose her consciousness suddenly. As far as we know, she wasn't on anything that could have altered her state of mind. So again, what could have caused her to fall in the first place? If she wasn't on drugs, we know that she wouldn't just suddenly just you know, plop into the water. Maybe she was drinking some sort of alcohol, but on the videos, she doesn't seem drunk. She doesn't seem intoxicated at all. Then we have to wonder how would she have just 
lost her balance and fell right in with first of all no one saying anything if she was in the more populated area and then if she fell in the creek behind her condo we have to ask how did no one see her there it seemed like a very common place for people to be walking back and forth between that back area and to the condos so i feel like if she fell in someone would have noticed something plus i also want to mention that the report itself said that there was absolutely no signs of visible trauma so if she slipped and fell and then died because of slipping and falling how would there have been no signs of any trauma she would have had a fractured skull or some sort of broken bones or abrasions to her bones but absolutely nothing was found so how does it make sense that she fell so within these two main theories i've been questioning how would she have just ended up in the water how would she have just accidentally slipped and fallen into the water if she you know was not any drugs or anything like that so with this theory the main theory that is discussed on the internet is the fact that she may have been suffering from some sort of mental health crisis. Just like I've been reiterating throughout this entire video and in a lot of my other videos, I think a lot of people are very quick to jump to the mental health card when someone goes missing. Now, Kaylin was 30 years old when she went missing. She had absolutely no personal history of any serious mental health conditions other than being in this funk that she was in because she was unemployed. Now, her brother did obviously have some sort of mental health issues. He was using drugs, he was in and out of jail, and again, he did put his family through a lot with a lot of his behaviors. We also do know about these 911 calls that admittedly were a little bit strange, but other than this, she showed absolutely no signs of any sort of mental health condition. But just to entertain this theory, and I want to look at both sides of the coin, we do know that it's possible that she could have had an episode of schizophrenia. Now, she is at the high end of the age range in which we typically see schizophrenia appear, but nonetheless, it's possible. We know that schizophrenia can be triggered by some sort of event, and we know that she did lose her job, and she was unemployed, and she was getting very frustrated about it. Again, we know that she was acting very strange in these 911 calls. She thought that she heard a gun in the clubhouse. She thought that someone, for some reason, had a gun. Now, I'm not exactly sure why she thought people had a gun, or if she feels like she heard a bang go off, because we don't have the transcript of that 911 call, but either way, she thought guns were involved. She thought people were breaking into her apartment when her roommate seemed that there was absolutely no way that anyone was breaking in. We also know about the one 911 call where she was just sort of muttering and saying that her roommate said that she was acting delusional and everything like that. Now, I will say during the 911 call that we actually got to hear, she was very concerned about her well-being and I will say that the way she was acting and responding to the situation was a little bit strange. She was talking to these intruders and yelling at them. I will say that that can be typical behavior of someone who is experiencing auditory hallucinations. Oftentimes when people have auditory hallucinations, it presents itself as people talking to them, saying very mean or disturbing things to them. So a lot of times people with schizophrenia will tell them to shut up and go away. So it's possible that she had been experiencing a worsening depression over the entire year after not being able to find a job. Maybe it got to the point where something in her head just sort of changed and she started experiencing all of these different symptoms that actually was schizophrenia. So maybe she was having a mental health episode when she made these 911 calls when she wandered off and possibly fell into the water. However, again, as we've been discussing this entire time, not to sound repetitive, but I don't see how this entire theory can be plausible given what we've seen in these videos and what we know about the water. She doesn't seem to be acting very strangely in the videos to me before she goes missing. So if she did have schizophrenia, maybe she just wasn't showing it in her actions or movements. I don't know. But to me, this does not prove that she had any sort of schizophrenia or mental health break. And again, autopsies don't lie. She didn't have any injuries. She didn't have any broken bones. So how would she have fallen into the water without any sort of injuries or anything like that? The other thing related to her having a mental health crisis is that maybe she went into the water willingly to take her own life. This would make sense for or why we didn't find any sort of injuries on her if she just sort of went into the water willingly and just drowned that way. Again, we know that she was in a bit of a funk for over a year from being unemployed, so maybe it just got to the point where she felt like she didn't have anywhere else to go after that. So maybe she ended her life because things were just getting so overwhelming and she just couldn't handle it anymore. 
Now, we know that the family said that she sounded very normal, but I will concede that some people are very, very good at hiding this type of thing. Some people in the deepest depths of depression show absolutely no signs to anyone around them, so people around them have absolutely no idea just because they put on a happy face and do everything that they can to act normally around their loved ones. And oftentimes depression comes with anxiety, so it's possible that these 911 calls were manifestations of her severe anxiety. However, I do keep going back to her dog, Phyllis. I just don't think she would have just simply left her dog behind without telling anyone. I feel like most people would give up their dog to a family member or make sure that their roommate was going to take good care of the dog and I feel like she would have at least asked the roommate like, hey, I'm going to be gone for a couple of days, will you take care of my dog? Just to make sure that she knew that she had to be home to take care of the dog. I don't know, I feel like obviously she wouldn't want to tell her roommate, I'm going to go take my life but I feel like she would have at least made some sort of excuse to tell her roommate that she needs her to take care of the dog. I feel like most people wouldn't just leave their dog with someone who's not expecting whatsoever to have to take care of them. It's also very, very common for people who are about to take their own lives to start giving away personal items and especially pets. So to me, the fact that she just left her dog behind and didn't give her to anybody just doesn't sit right with me. There's also the fact that I can understand how hard it is to be unemployed and not know where you're life is going, and I don't want to downplay any of that, but it is a very common thing that people go through. Most people have been unemployed at some point in their lives, and no matter how tough it may be, there's always a way out, and people have an amazing way of picking themselves back up and making something of themselves after going through something really, really tough. So to me, just given what we know about the evidence, it doesn't seem like there's anything pointing towards this theory. Then of course, we always have to discuss the possibility of foul play. Now, like I said earlier, the reason that they aren't considering foul play in this case is because there's no trauma to her body. But like we said earlier, that also doesn't point to her falling into the river because there would have been signs of trauma. I think it's more likely that someone could have drowned her or done something else to her that wouldn't have made a mark on her bones than her falling into the river and somehow not having a single injury. There's so many more ways that you can kill someone without leaving any sort of injury or break to their bone. I think that's a lot more likely than her having a traumatic fall and not breaking a single bone. I also want to go back to the police phone calls. Again, a lot of people say she was acting completely erratically, but what if she wasn't? There's no actual evidence to say that she was acting erratically. There's no proof that says that no one was messing with her. There's no proof that says that no one was at her apartment that day. There's no proof that she was incoherent. She sounded alert and responsive in her phone call. Yes, her roommate denied the possibility of someone coming in like we discussed earlier, but we don't know whether her roommate was just trying to explain away something scary. Maybe she was also terrified and was like, no, there's no way. You see it's locked and that's it. And she's just trying to explain it away because it's scary. Maybe she genuinely didn't think there was anyone in the apartment because maybe she didn't hear anything. Maybe she had headphones on. Maybe she had a TV on or maybe she wasn't as paranoid as Kaylin was, so maybe she just didn't pay attention to noise and just assumed it was a neighbor. I feel like there's so many other possibilities within this theory other than just assuming that Kaylin was crazy. It's possible that people really were standing outside of her window and looking at her. It's possible that someone broke into her apartment just to scare her. It's possible that all of these things were happening. Maybe it was someone that she knew. Maybe the reason she was walking around outside that day was to meet up with someone who ended up having bad intentions. Maybe it was someone that lived in the same complex as her who she thought was her friend, so she was happening to meet up with them to hang out that day, still dressed in her bummy clothes because you don't dress up when you're just going to hang out with a friend, and this person secretly had some bad intentions and had been messing with her the entire time. It does seem like her apartment was locked when she went missing and she took her keys with her, but the way she was dressed shows that she wasn't expecting to be gone long, so I do think it's very possible that she was just going to meet up with a friend who maybe had bad intentions. Or maybe she had a stalker. I want to remind you that behind the condo there's a lot of trees and bushes and that means it's very possible that someone could hide behind them and follow her and watch her. I also want to go back to the surveillance videos and say that we see the red car driving back and forth and we see her roommate walking. I feel like there's a reason that they released those videos to the public. 
What does her roommate have anything to do with this? I also want to point out the fact that we haven't really heard anything from the roommate. She hasn't really talked out about the disappearance, so we don't really know what happened with her roommate that day. We also see her running back and forth between the garage and where she was taking her dog out, so it's very possible that she could have been running up to grab something from her roommate or hand something to her roommate and then ran back. We don't really know because we know that her roommate was in the garage at some point, so maybe that's why she was running up to her. Now, of course, I'm not blaming the roommate. I'm not saying that she had absolutely anything to do with it, but I do think that there's a reason that police released these security images of her car and her walking back to the garage. I'm just wondering why would they release those videos if they didn't mean anything? I also wonder why hasn't the roommate spoken up and said anything? We don't know much about the day she actually disappeared. We don't know anything that happened the day of those surveillance videos other than what we see. And I imagine the roommate was home at some point. So why didn't the roommate say anything about that day? Was there anything out of the ordinary in her behavior? We have no idea. And I also have no idea why the roommate hasn't come out and said anything. It's been five years. Why hasn't she said anything? Again, I'm definitely not pinning anything on the roommate, but I do think that these things are just a little bit strange. So those are really the main theories in Kaylin's case. The last theory to me is that her death could have been a combination of all of the theories put together. Maybe she did have a mental health crisis and then wandered off in the area and then someone recognized that she was delusional and decided to take advantage of her and throw her in the water. That could be very possible. That could also be the reason why she seemed to have just left her condo unannounced. It could have been why she was seen in that particular area of the river, a more populated area of the town. She could have been met with foul play somewhere near that area and maybe no one saw anything because they went into the more desolate or isolated forest area and that's where someone did something to her. Or maybe she was picked up by someone and they did something to her and threw her in the river. Honestly, I don't know, but I do think that this could be possible. I usually like to discuss what I think is the most likely theory, but to me, I have absolutely no idea at this point. I don't think that there's any evidence from what we can see that she had any sort of paranoia or delusions. Now, with that being said, is it possible that she did have these symptoms? Yes, but I don't think we've seen anything that necessarily definitively points in that direction. Now, I will say that the thing that stands out to me is her telling these intruders to shut up and go away. That really does stand out to me as something that someone with schizophrenia may do with hallucinations that they're hearing. But again, other than that, I think pretty much everything else is very explainable. I think it's possible that she was paranoid about people harming her and through all of the articles I read, the research that I did, the podcasts that I listened to, and the videos that I watched on her case, they didn't really go in to mention what I'm kind of thinking. I think in every case that involves a woman suddenly becoming paranoid, we should consider that maybe something happened to her and she just isn't telling anybody. I know many situations where a woman is her and she doesn't want to tell anyone she's hurt because she's embarrassed or she feels guilty or whatever else it may be. So maybe someone had harmed her and then came back and killed her. Maybe it was an ex-boyfriend or a friend who had bad intentions that harmed her. Again, maybe she was meeting up with someone to make amends after they harmed her and they ended up just harming her again. I don't know, but I don't want anything to be left out. Again, at the end of the day, I think that this case involves a lot more than just a very small accident that happened to Caitlin. I think that her case definitely needs to be looked into a lot more by police and detectives, and I think if it's not, it's a huge slap in the face to Caitlin and her family. But that is where I'm going to end today's video. Again, I have absolutely no idea what to think, so I'm really looking forward to hearing your guys' thoughts and theories in the comments. Comments. Do you think that this was just an accident or do you think foul play was involved? Do you think that she had some sort of mental health crisis? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!